Yeah. Um, so Carl started off the uh, seminars earlier this week uh, with this question. And this question, I think, is important um, for discussing this period in terms of Christianity, early medieval Christianity. Um, and it's, it's just the question of, uh, did the early monks and monasteries get eradicated by the Romans and replaced by anti-British religious orders from France? And when we look at Christianity, especially in the early medieval period, it seems to be a very highly religious um, society. Um, however, the archaeology could be telling us that this is possibly over-exaggerated. Um, and it seems that most pre-Norman Christianity had been wiped out. Um, and possibly not even there. Um, we discussed this in quite a lot of depth, and I even mentioned how um, even just religious imagery and statues, for example, we I showed um, a second century um, image of the Passion, which I'll show before the break, but um, of the Passion, and just shows how um, over time, when you go to later medieval period, um, Christianity and is... Uh, is art changes and to me that just showed that maybe yeah. possibly Christianity was over exaggerated in the early medieval period and it was in its early stages and it just developed more as time had gone on um, and we're going to look at a couple of sites which are quite interesting really that have uh, sort of shown us these early uh, medieval Christianity uh, churches and um, some cathedrals and abbeys as well um, which will allow us to discuss this question in depth. Um, ooh, hang on. So the first one that I'm discussing, so the, the image on the left is Landavery Castle. And it's a late 13th century grade two listed castle ruin um, and is in Carmarthenshire, Wales. And is said that the Normans had built this castle um, in a current location in the early 12th century um, and it was rebuilt in stone and it was burnt in the early 16th century um, and never repaired. And it has a connection with um, Tally Abbey, which is uh, in the same area. And Tally Abbey was founded in the 1180s by Rhys Ap Grufford, um, the Lord Rees, who was a native ruler of South Wales in the kingdom of De Herben Bath. De he Bath. Thank you, um, Del, thank you so much. Um, De he Bath. No, and, I've got a passion for that end. Oh, do you? And that kingdom. Amazing. I think I might have to talk to you no. about some things as well. Um, oh. See if you've given me some information. Please do. Um, please do. Yeah, no, thank you, Del. Um, you're gonna be, you might be helpful in the future. Um, anyway, um, so this was one of the first and only abbey, uh, uh, first and only abbey for Wales, um, for people living in this area. And the monks that lived there were also known as the White Canons, um, and that was due to the colour of their habit. And the the, the last remaining pieces of this is this the, this tower here and is in full height and I think is an impressive feature of it um, and however it never really enjoyed the wealth and success of the Cistercian religion settlement that religious settlements and it, it, I think it just sort of tells us almost a little bit of what is going on in this time period and I think it just sort of brings up this uh, question on whether um, the, the Normans have brought religious over um, and brought them over to the Welsh princes. The theory is, is that maybe we're not as religious as we think, or maybe that there was no um, Christianity before them, but I think evidence like this proves that there was. And today we're going to have, uh, we're going to give you tools in a way to sort of discuss this uh, debate because it seems like a very uh, heavily debated topic that has no conclusive evidence at the moment um, and it just seems to be a lot of theories but this is something I think that needs to have a discussion with um, just because it's a period that has a lot of assumptions the early medieval period and so I think it's important to getting down to it and finding out 
what's so important and why is it so different to what we're actually told. Um, I know the high school, um, what I was taught was not um, what I've learned through history and archaeology and it, it sometimes it does annoy me, especially uh, with the fact that my sister comes home from school with the same sort of homework um, that I did almost over like 10 years ago now which is a uh, shocking but it, it just I think it just annoys me a little bit how it doesn't change and it seems to be the same sort of assumptions really and I think we're just looking at uh, here sort of um, how history books are claiming something that was very religious that could possibly not be so we see things like this and the connection with this here is that um, there was a rebellion in Landovery in 15. 31 at uh, 32 as well um which had saw a lot of uh, a lot of uh, monasteries obviously gone etc because of the union act of wales and england and king henry was like oh, get rid of them all um so th they have connections because this is showing how um religion is important i think to to people in wales um and how it's given us some sort of evidence to look closer um I know we've talked about this um, a couple of lessons ago um, and is one of my favourite little pieces to find is St. Doc Deed's Cross. Um, now, what's quite interesting about this, I think I, I've discussed in previous lessons, is that we seem to think that it's uh, been built up from a Roman villa that was found there um, because it seems like they've been, this part above onwards seems to be added on. Um, and the detailing here um, seems to be different to the detailing here as well. Um, and when I done my little video of this, it was just uh, basically what I saw and what I had read. But Carl's interpretation of it has really changed my mind because I remember in my video, I was looking at um, the man on the horse here. And there was um, on this side here, um, I couldn't get a photo of it. Um, there was almost like... Um, a face of someone and I just said possibly this is someone maybe of high status and they're just trying to sort of um, make themselves known and if this is something that was taken from a Roman filler then possibly it would say to me that if, if it was a Roman villa then someone of high status would have lived there so personally I seem to think that what I was saying about this being a high status individual um, would sort of go along with this whole Roman villa idea. Um, but again, it, it is still unknown. But the way it's just placed, it seems like it's been added on to each other um, throughout time. And this, th this, this is an area I think that's got a lot of importance to people because um, you get to a very interesting thing that I had found in the research um, of this place. I've really been going hard on this area because I just find it amazing that this is stood there and it's just in amongst all these graves and there's nothing to point to where you, you've got to really know about it and the houses behind the church um was where they found the early medieval burial sites um and the next thing that i want to talk about is a certain burial here that could pass and um, that's them also um looking at it and excavating it as well um seems to be very important but this burial is what caught my attention and I I had to add it in I was talking to Carl about it um, just before the lesson started but it's called the suffering that when you type it in on google it's called the suffering of burial 631 and is in the um is in the museum of wales um online and they provide some good images that three of them I've provided here and they found in the middle of the graveyard in 1994 they found um, a burial um, from the early medieval period that had a very unusual practice um, and what was going on was that they were putting um, houses there which are now there now and I, I look at those houses and think oh gosh I wonder if they knew how much of a, an important spot this was for um, a lot of finds and um, this was a site, like I said, outside the churchyard um, of the present church of St. Docteed. And the burials, there was 800 of them dating from the 4th to the 11th century AD. And they've had a, a careful look at the skeletons, which have been able to provide a fresh light on the population of Wales at this time. But this one grave was the one that was seen to be 
of interest for archaeologists. So this was a burial that was laid in the middle of the cemetery and it was of a young, a young man aged between 25 and 35. He was about um, 5.75 feet tall and uh, radiocarbon dating of the bones suggested that he had died between 340 to 660 AD. And it was, it was not his antiquity that made him special at all. It was the two iron straps that he had wore around his waist. The ends of these straps were secured behind his back. The tapered iron ends passed through lugs and were hammered over by a second person, making it impossible for the wearer to remove the straps unaided. Clearly, this was more of a fashion accessory. But the question was, what does this, what did this serve? Now, if we're going to go down this route, the, the early medieval period was a very highly uh, religious society, um, especially in terms of Christianity. Then some archaeologists were arguing that this was a, an act of penance. Um, and this would fit the context with the fact that this was a monastic community as well. And they've even looked at similar cases that were found in the Middle Ages. Um, for example, there was a visionary monk at the monastery of Much Wenlock um, in Shropshire. Um, and there was an early 8th century um, uh, device called a beggar um, who, uh, who wore an iron girdle um, about his loins for the love of God. So that was one interpretation of it. And then someone has gone even further to give an alternative interpretation, which would suggest that we can't keep going down this route of this being um, everything medieval is highly uh, religious and got something to do with Christianity. The other one was that it was served as a hernia belt, which is quite interesting. Um, and they looked at Roman texts that first discuss the use of hernia belt on the continent. So the examples that they have found from excavations in the past um, are from France, Germany, Switzerland and Spain from the 6th to 7th century. And they seem very similar. Um, so uh, people have been discussing whether this is a, um, a penance belt or a hernia um, truss, um, but the, the, the Museum of Wales have come up with the interpretation that is probably likely to be a little bit of both. Um, they said that in the early medieval period, endurance of suffering was seen as a path to heaven. And so enduring pain of a hernia may itself be an act of penance from, uh, from which the wearer had these two belts hope to reap the reward for the afterlife. So it's quite an interesting interpretation, really. Um, oh, I just see something in the chat, I'll have a look. It's not allowing me to see on the chat, so I'll have a look um, towards the break. But it was a very interesting burial, uh, nonetheless, I found. Um, and you can see how the interpretations are affected, because the only thing that we have evidence that there was a monastic community here really was um, that cross. Um, and it shows that it clearly was something that was uh, close to people. But what I was thinking with the fact that there was a cross and no other structure found to me, maybe that cross was put there and um, Christian uh, ceremonies were done out in the open. Now, there's something that we know that a lot of things like this were done out in the open. And so to me, maybe they had the cross and this was done out in the open and they had a churchyard um, nearby because at the time there was no hierarchy really in the church. It was everyone um, celebrated together. Whereas now you have uh, the altar that separates everyone from uh, the, the, everyone else is worshipping in the crowd and you've also got um, parts of the choir, etc. So, um, Personally, I think maybe this was sort of uh, where someone stood and sort of gave their uh, teachings and possibly had a little cemetery nearby. Um, but I don't think it was as big as what they say it was in terms of a, a monastery, because it just seems to be uh, no evidence of it as from that time period anyway. And then we get to Kaya Went, which is also a, a very interesting one. Um, this temple here at Kaya Went. Um, it's a Roman temple, um, and this was thought to be where, um, oh, that, that, that's quite an interesting one, Dal, um, that a youngster of a son who sent, it, it sent them for 
get masturbating stop him yeah that could be an interesting one um that's also a, a lot of things that i've read as well um seems like a lot of people have had a lot of different interpretations coming from this but um, i think especially as you know as a younger son especially of a prominent family because we know you know mm. the older son would have inherited the next one would have at something and then the youngest one would have got into the church yeah just yeah. that's how it was so maybe yeah the youngest son was a bit sort of randy <laughs> so they needed to do something to sort him out yeah yeah it, it, this yeah that, i think that's a very possible one. Oh, there's never um one in the chat um why metal when they had leather mm. um I, I possibly d yeah, I think maybe because Levers is, if it's going to be an act of penance, it's going to be very uncomfortable. Is is choosing the most uncomfortable uh, things, really, aren't they? Um, unless you've got something else that can come into that, Anne, of why you. But I, I personally think that metal would just be the most uncomfortable thing, and it, if it's an act of penance well, or. When I did my nurse training in the early 90s we did a lot about uh, I did mental health nurse training yeah and we did a lot about um practices and things and the Victorians produced these oh, things with spikes that went over the penis so if the lad yeah you know, had a hard on it would hurt yeah. So it was punishment for natural stuff. Yeah. But those things did exist. Yeah. So it... they wouldn't have got that because they made it up. It would have been stuff they knew mm. and was passed on. Yeah. No, the only reason I said why metal, why, why not leather, you know, because uh, that was in respect of the hernia. I thought, yeah. you know, they would use something a bit mm. more comfortable. So it does seem to be like a some sort of punishment, really. Yeah, um, and, and, and even... With the back, you know, because they, they sometimes uh, put braces on people's backs, you know, yeah. they've got a broken back or something. But Yeah. But I think because of the age of the uh, remains, yeah. skeleton, I think it's more to do with he's in a religious establishment yeah. Therefore, oh, you've had hard on. We're going to sort you out. Yeah, if yeah. You know what I mean. Um, in terms of the hernia as well, Anne. Um, if if that was the case, um, the 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 Museum of Wales was saying that the fact that they possibly didn't use it with kit, you know, having a hernia was possibly a way of penance as well. Um, you see a lot of saints and mystics sort of having these horrible traumatic things happen to them and they're fine with it because um they feel like that's god reaching out to them but they, they try and make it worse yeah. maybe having metal if it was a hernia would make it even more worse as well and um, it's quite yeah. interesting the interpretations we've actually pulled from that as well um i like yeah. your one del um thank you yeah it's all right um you, you could possibly imagine couldn't you um <laughs> Yeah. But it's, 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 it's quite painful. interesting. It would not. I'm not saying it's painful from personal experience, <laughs> but it would be painful. Yeah, but but... Another thing I know the old Welsh saints did was sit under cold waterfalls. Mm. You know, and I think that yeah. was sort of right. We got to get rid of this feeling now. We're not allowed to accept. Yeah. We're not allowed to get. You know relationships yeah. so they tried to sit under cold waterfalls yeah right as an aside that wouldn't work for me <laughs> I, I i also think as well that because it's interesting there's only one person with that device on them um yeah. and yeah it was the 631st mm. one out of uh, all of them um i think maybe possibly if we're going to go down um if we were to argue that christianity was a very um important and very 
present um like we think and possibly this is sort of the beginnings of uh, things like that penance ensuring that you're controlling yourself the, the early start of control really um just and we're seeing it in that site really but it's, it's, it's a very interesting one especially with the fact that they're able to work connect it with two uh, different what types they call of those ancient Egypt monks pardon sorry Anne. what they call is it ascetics or the egyptian christian monks in the early years who, who they used to sit on sort of columns oh yeah yeah. I, yeah aesthetics yeah aesthetics. yeah yeah aesthetics well yeah. I, think, yeah. I think we all know that religious uh, orders uh, do have very strict mm. penance and rituals mm. um and is that is that one of them you know we don't know but it could be no. but he could have died through it yeah. <laughs> Well, don't come to Puth Call on a Friday morning at six o'clock when I go to St. David's Well up the lanes and I'm sat there oh. in all of my glory. <laughs> Joking. Joking. We'd have to be careful that someone might try oh, to find oh, you, you especially if it's going on YouTube. It would scare you. <laughs> um, so I'll go back to Kaya Wend, um, this temple. Um, there's been lots of reconstructions of it, but we're just looking at this here, the remains. Um, and it's been discussed to be something that brought um, Wales, Britain to the period of Christianity. Um, it's been argued that um, here would be the altar um, and possibly the, the, the way people would sort of just access in. And it seems to be a very open sort of communal uh, bit as well. <laughs> and they're saying that, that, that this is something that has brought Christianity, but really to me, the only thing that would sort of show that it was Christianity was this evidence of what looks like an altar. There doesn't really seem to be much evidence of that in terms of the structure. Um, possibly because again, Christianity in terms of the way that his look has changed in Britain over time from the Roman period to the later medieval so possibly this was just an early form of a church but it, it just doesn't seem like it makes sense that just because it has something that looks like an altar the the argument that this was evidence to say that it was early Christian and um this is something that we were all practicing at the time but it's still an interesting interpretation overall um I don't know why my mouse does this sometimes. Um, and then they get to um, a very interesting... Sorry, Jess. Yeah? I yeah? know I'm interrupting today. It's okay. But looking at that, at that period, would the early Christians have had or took over what was a sort of pagan site? Yeah. Wouldn't they have gone off secretly and had chapels, chapels yeah. in inverted commas, houses, places to meet because they would have been persecuted? Yeah. And yeah. if I go back to something that we've done before, mm -hmm. um, St. Peter's Supermontem above yeah. Brenna which I've been to a few times, um, that's supposed to be a very ancient early church site. Yeah. And I've, I've got the thingy and blacket book. I've been there and I've considered it and I've listened to my family history. And that's supposed to be one of the earliest mm. places. And it makes sense because it's up on a hill. It's by a hill fort. It's by yeah. not too far from a, a Roman marching fort. But I don't think early Christians at that point would have. I don't think they would have dared take over somewhere that was pagan. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah. They would yeah. have created their own place yeah sorry 
you know, as far as it, I, I like that. No, so I'm just uh, saying that I don't think because I want know you know what I know about the Bible and the New Testament and yeah, Paul's letters. I don't think they would have even considered going into that place, even if it was abandoned. Mm. Because I think they would have done something somewhere else. Yeah. And left it, which is possibly why it was abandoned, because no way, we're not going in there, it's pagan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I I like that. Thank you, Del. Um, sorry, I, I, sorry to interrupt. The little things you add to, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's very interesting one. But um, I think this is something that has added even more sort of intrigue to it. Um, we're jumping out of Wales here, um, and is saying that archaeologists have discovered uh one of Britain's oldest churches, I and mean, it's such a bold claim, uh, really as well. Mm. Um, that is it from uh the the plan um, of what it looks like um, and it, it's quite interesting because of they saying this is um, a church and it could possibly well be um, a church um, and I think it, it does show evidence that it is a church um, so hang on I'm just going to get my little pen out here um, so this is in Northumbria in Lindisfarne um, and in 2017 they had found this uh, early medieval church um, and they're saying this is a proper church and they're saying this is from the mid 7th century AD um, and this is where a part of northern and central England was eventually Christianised and they're saying it's important to have um, a key site at the spiritual heart of the 8th century monastic community and this was even uh, made famous in the early medieval illuminated manuscript called the Lindisfarne Gospels. And what they're saying here in terms of uh, what they're looking at, so obviously you've got um, the structure here. Um, draw him out. Structure here. And it, it, it seems like the uh, brickwork as well, it seems to be uh, different types of stones. Um, and they did they, they, not small stones either they're saying that they're about um big pieces of uh sandstone that are very heavy as well um the same three foot in length as well these sand blocks um and it, it, it's ask us was this telling us about the anglo-saxon period and um they just have already put a tag on it really straight away um and i do like the fact that they've managed to bring forward an illuminating manuscript into all this um but, but they believe that by here um would have been the altar and by here would have been possibly the the the, the, the chancel um, and they believe that this part here all this here would have been the nave um, and thinking that possibly here um, would have been the entrance and maybe another entrance around by here as well um, and it just seems like to, to, it doesn't seem like this was it seems perfectly level this ruins um, it ruins when you find them are not always um, one level. They seem to be all over the place, etc. And it seems like what we were discussing here was that maybe this was um, because you see that this part here was added on afterwards. Um, so it almost shows that this would have just been a, a big room that they worshipped in, um, that like that open space I was talking about. And then later on, um, they had a little bit of division where um, they would have the altar, et cetera. Um, but the altar normally gets stood by here as well. Um, in most, um, when you go to my church, for example, you've got the altar there and then you've got the priest that speaks here um, and you could have like the choir and someone playing the piano by there. Um, and then everyone sits all by here. Um, it, it seems like that it was very inclusive um, and the altar was left towards the back as well. So it, it's very interesting. But the reason why it's come to interest is because um, there's lots of indications to say that this was um, an early medieval church that was here. We've got um, illuminated manuscripts to say that. Um, but they're saying that what is going on here was that maybe 
it was demolished um it was taken away from us in the norman period and the community had sort of gone back and had sort of marked out where it used to be with the stones that were left from when it was demolished and um, just based on how perfectly level it all was and how um, certain part of it doesn't seem to be right the stones seem to be not the same shape etc and there's part of it missing on certain sides and it, it just seems like a, a little bit of a mess but the radiocarbon dating of this it, it tells us that um this is a period um a lot later than what is forced when you look at the documentary evidence they're sort of saying that this is maybe an offering to remember what used to be there um because um you know why would you know why would this be allowed to happen if it was such an important mm. thing and personally i think it's because the normans are brought to his collapse um, uh, and sorry but, jess yeah no it's all right can i interject again and yeah. be naughty <laughs> no i think i no. my understanding is and this is just me uneducated in history but knowing lots of legends, but I don't think the early Christians, Roman, post-Roman, had specific buildings to worship in. I feel they had, because it was that sort of intermix between earlier religions, faiths, beliefs, and Christianity, that they had basically a person's home, a large house, maybe the lord of the place, the lady of the place, and what we call Tumpath Doileth, mm. which attempts earthworks, which we know in later times that uh, were used for people to meet and gather. Mm. And we know there are sort of stones and standing stones and stuff. And I wonder if that is where, when they needed to do a proper communal worship, that's where they went. Mm. But in between that, they worshipped in one another's homes, houses, farmsteads. Yeah. Wow. I don't know if in Wales at that time, I, I've, I've I'd call it manor houses, but, you know. Mm. You do, I think you're mixing up a lot of different things. I think that mm. what happened after the Romans was, the, mm. you know, we did have Christians and, mm. you know, we had early Christians because mm. it was the age of the saints, you know. Yes. The saints came over, like St. David and St. Mm. Augustine and all that. And, and but they, they were kind of... Um, in between the, the Saxons invading, when the Saxons yes. invaded Lindisfarne, you know, they, they really, um, this, you know, this could have been an early Christian. It could have been an early Christian before the Saxons came and, and mm. you know, wrecked, mm. wrecked it all. Um, mm. we, yeah, we, it is true. We did have little, just mm. you know, just crosses that we put somewhere, and and yeah. you know, monks and things, you know. Um, yeah. but, but I think you're still trying to talk about early medieval, really, aren't you? Yeah, well, is it Christianity mm. was very different before the Ro mm. before the Normans? Yeah, very, the, very uh, and yeah. And I think, simple, you know, more simple. Yeah, and, and uh, that, that's a, mm -hmm. you know, we know that they liked um, preaching in open spaces. And mm -hmm. what they were saying here was that there's evidence to suggest that this was um, like a little place of worship, really. However, mm -hmm. um, they're just saying that it just doesn't add up because the stone's uh, not uniform um, and it's not well structured. So they think that possibly the stones were put there to remember. Mm. But the archaeologists were also saying that the, the stone masonry, the, the pieces of broken masonry um, and crudely worked window surrounds, is, they're saying that this possibly was suggesting that the mason was more accustomed to working with wood than in stone as well. Um, but there's a lot of sort of talk about who it could be, but they're saying um, immediately here 
um, that this would have been installed by Saint Aidan as well. Um, oh yeah. After he had founded Ooh. the monastery in 635 AD. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so that, that's a part of a clue of his age as well. Um, and mm. but even the illuminated manuscript is sort of alluding to things like that. Um, but it just shows that why, if if it was an illuminated manuscript and it was. Uh, but you had St Aidan here and it seemed to be something that was very important to people. Why, when the Normans had come over, did this did this sort of deteriorate? It doesn't make sense that it would have deteriorated because people just sort of left it. I personally think that it was something that was erased really from our history and possibly it yeah. still just put there to remember where it once was because if they've got um, a saint being definitely this, this is something important to them um so i think yeah. it, i think christianity was is in the early medieval period is sort of similar but not similar to the later medieval mm. period i do think there's certain parts of it that are different and i think that's just part of down to mm. development before the break i want to show you um, quick, uh, I think I'll do it after the break because I've got to quickly find the uh, PowerPoint. But I'll show you um, its depictions of Christ on the cross from the Roman period right up until the later medieval period. And mm -hmm. it just shows my point a little bit more better how things have developed over time in terms of Christianity, things like meditation, um, people really thinking in on about it and it's created um, a lot more um, well, theolo the theological debate sort of booms after the Norman Normans are king here. So it seems like the, it seems to be early stages and they're still having that sense of community rather ex than exclusion because um, churches um, after the Norman uh, period, that, like I said, the altar was not here. It was sort of towards here and you had someone that would stand here mm. and um, it, and then everyone was sort of separated where it seems like here, it just seemed like it was a big room and the altar was just put there um, mm. because it was part of uh, sacrifice worship um, yeah. I'm, I always used to think when I was in class because we'd always talk about the Eucharist um, in a Catholic school it was the one thing that in transubstantiation and all I said was and I, I, I did get a sort of a, a few marks of this in my little essay I said that um, Catholic religion always reminds me um, of sacrifice in the early periods because you've got Christ who's the lamb of God being taken to the altar and it's, that's a sacrifice in itself um, and what Christ done on the cross is a sacrifice and it gets done over and over and over every time you have communion and I just felt like that, that sacrifice has always been important it's just it's developed over time to what it means and what is talked about really um if i said oh i go to church every week to sacrifice then people look at me gone off but if i say the eucharist it, it means different so i think sacrifice has stayed with us um throughout time it just changes with with yeah culture. that's absolutely good that's absolutely yeah. lovely jess it's not because really i'm a non-conformist <laughs> i've been brought up as a non-conformist mm. i don't fully understand anglican and I don't understand Catholicism, yeah. even though I've read about them all and stuff. Yeah. But for me, um, looking at early worship and um, from my background, it would be all we need, you know, yes, you no, know, a sacrificial lamb, yes. Mm, yeah. You know, it's fine. Yeah, no, no, that. that's what I always Except saw it that. like. So but, when I was younger, I was like, oh, it's, it's, you know, yeah. we're no really different yeah. to the but, prehistoric times with sacrifices. Yeah, from my point of view, we can reach God, we can reach Jesus anywhere. Yeah. We can meet in a house, we can meet in a field, we can meet in a car park, mm. whatever. So when I look at these buildings and I try to think back, it's either post-Constantine, where they had the um, uh, worshipping, no, well, you know, yeah. the gods, the Roman gods. And I think, you know, are these people trying to sort of try to keep up with customs, yeah. try to keep up with fashion. And, oh, right, okay, oh, we got this temple now, right, okay, we'll take all the 
gods and goddesses out. Mm. We'll turn it into a Christian church. Yeah. That was what would go through my mind. Yeah. And I don't mean to be sort of offensive towards other Christian faiths. Yeah. But that's the thing that goes through my mind when I look at this place. And I think, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I'm no, going to have to go after the break. Yeah. No, I've that's got fine. My second objection. Oh, very oh, exciting, fine. Del. Oh, we're going to celebrate. <laughs> One step closer to normality, I feel like. Oh, flipping egg. I hope so. When yeah, you had your words. So. Have you um, had yours yet, Jess? Um, I've had my first one, yeah. Um, that was oh, a, a couple of weeks oh, that's ago. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And you've had yours? Yes, I've had two. Oh, lovely. Pat? Yes, two. Oh, lucky. Oh, lovely. <laughs> we're, all old, we're all older than you, Jess. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah, no. I, I only managed Look, to get I'm 58. I'm going on 59. Next oh, year, wow. my wife will be 60. Oh, when I'm 60, I'm going to celebrate with a big party and fireworks. <laughs> yes, I think it'll be fantastic. After, after everything that we've gone through as well. With oh, flip it out, I think yes. I can't wait for one big party. Yes, but thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jess. It's all right. Um, I think we'll go into a break now anyway. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Anne. So, no, thank you, Dal, for your interpretations. Um, See you in a bit. Yeah, sorry to be a pain, but it's okay. I think that's what these things are about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's no good. I don't think it's any good coming to one of these meetings and just sitting there and listening. I think we have to sort of talk, give our that, opinions, that's what history and possibly argue. Yeah, but but the thing is, when you when you say what you what you say, mm. um. There's not enough time really to to answer what you what you're talking about. That's right. It That's is right. actually a theological debate, you know. There's yeah. going oh, on. Flipping yeah, it. Go on, time immemorial. <laughs> That's why I said this is my belief. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and I I don't disrespect anybody else's. No, beliefs. but it, it, it's, it's, it's all beliefs and sort of. I, I'm, yeah, it, it's we have a what lot of, I grew up with. We have a lot of religious discussions in oh, my house. Flip my mum's got I a could be Russian Orthodox. <laughs> oh, I've... can you believe that? <laughs> or even Ethiopian Orthodox. Yeah, just to explore them all. Oh, yeah. Um, no, no, we're very. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of religious discussions in my house. Um, just all different types of religions. <laughs> no, we are different, different why don't you zoom us in? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 just bring you into the living room with my family and just sort of see the discussions. That come oh, that'd be lovely. Absolutely lovely. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you go because oh, we've got a um, Catholic you. Bible, Jehovah Witness. Yeah. Um, we, we've even mm. looked at the Quran, etc. It's something that we do because we just like to look at it because yeah, it's I important for a lot of people. I don't object to looking at any other religious book. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, I've so, got so, Muslim so, friends, I've got Sikh friends. Yeah, no, new uh, friends, whatever. Yeah, is it, is it nice to have, be diverse and just listen to I've all even different got friends who don't believe. Well, you yeah, know, they so still, the Muslims still sacrifice lambs. You yes. Know? And and um, I don't even know, perhaps the Jews still do sacrifice. I'm, I'm uh, not, not sure. sure if they do. I but, know the um, um, surviving Samaritans do. And I think there's only two men left alive who can do it. Oh, wow. It's quite interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I found something on um, YouTube the other day because I go on these odd sites. Yeah. And I think there's only two eligible men left with the Samaritans who can do the sacrificial stuff on... Uh, Mount Herman. Yeah, yeah, I think. Or whatever they are. So, yeah. so my my interpretation was that Jesus became the Lamb, and yes. he was the sacrifice once and yes. for all. Yes. And you don't have to keep doing it all the time because no. you've no. got grace 
you know, the church taught you that, you know, you only got grace by doing communion every day, you know, like receiving communion mm. and, and doing all the rites and everything. Oh, we only do but that. Jesus once said, you know, he became the lamb and he mm. only did, you know, he did it once and for all. So we yes. have got to move on. That's what from we there. believe. But the problem is, is, is keeping people. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, it was difficult. You know, the 18th century, 15th century, really, for it to start to come through again. The mm. old early Christianity, uh, you know. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. it was uh, quick, because my teachers always said, when we did Roman Catholicism as GCSE, they always said that um, communion is god uh, is jesus and he's been sacrificed over and over this inner mm. passion happens over and over and it used to sort of blow my head as a kid i mm. think more of it is symbolic rather than saying yeah, that that's yeah. actually jesus. when we do communion which is once a month in a non-conformist church mm. it's do this in remembrance yeah, yeah. of me mm. yeah and we take we take the at the moment we got this little thing he wants because we can't do it properly yeah and we've got this little package and we peel the top off and there's a little wafer which we're not used to yeah, because we're not used to it because we're used to breaking a loaf of bread and then we take the wafer we break it in half we take that and that's in remembrance of his sacrifice body and then we have a couple of prayers and stuff and then it's drink this wine which is a remembrance of my spilt blood so yeah. we break it the thingy tab off for the communion wine it's absolutely horrible mind to yeah taste. i i my mum told me a it's horrible not story because um, our church doesn't allow alcohol yeah yeah, my church is. Oh it, it well, I'm fine. not joining your church then. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know when they um break the uh the, the big host and then they yes. the, the, sometimes to chuck the little bits left over in yeah. the wine. Oh, yeah. Well, my mum had the lovely pleasure of having a, a swig and um oh. it felt this big sort of chunk. Of yeah. Horrible. Yeah. And I don't really. I told her that it was possibly from the bigger house, but it could possibly be someone spitting it back out in there, which I don't oh, really want to think of. And especially with to, COVID yeah. times, it stresses you out to think of. It's a sharing yeah. from a glass. In an earlier Baptist church that I was a member of locally, and I ended up being responsible for sorting out the communion table. Yeah. I used to do and, the offertory. Oh, flipping heck. Oh. We had this container of communion wine non-alcoholic but every time I opened it it would fizz <laughs> it had been there that long because you know we only need well, 20 mm. glasses mm. and it would fizz and I tasted it one day and I thought that's <laughs> alcoholic it's fermented yeah, oof, oof. and it was a case of this is horrible because people, what people used to do in the past, whatever was left, they couldn't tip it down the drain. Mm. They have to pour it back into the container. Yeah, they've got a so little obviously box. whatever was in the air. So yeah. I soon sorted that out. I'm yeah, I put my have... kettle on now. <laughs> yeah, and I'm gonna go get the kettle. Oh, um, yeah. I'll see you guys and... in a bit. <laughs> yeah, because I gotta go. I gotta get ready for my job. Good luck. See you next Del. week. Bye. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye.
Try on. You're on mute. And you're on mute. Okay. Here you go. Oh, I didn't, I forgot where I was. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Anne. Oh, well, we've, looking... we've got a little bit of an incident now. My sister is meant to be picked up from her high school oh. and they won't let them out. And there's police there. Apparently there's been an incident on the outside of the school gates. So they, oh. as a precaution, they're not letting children home yet. So oh. there's helicopters flying about all sorts. Oh, it's really going off here. And... Oh, it's a bit yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, really, the, the things like this, you know, are happening, especially especially when it's so close to where you live. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I bet my sister's not too happy that she's stuck in school, <laughs> to be honest. She was oh, meant to be out over a half an hour ago. Oh, right. Yeah, so uh, look, she, the, 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 you can see how the rumours are already spreading within the school, though, because she's messaged my mum and have said that there's been a stabbing in the school. Oh. I've done a bit of digging and found that the corpus my school and um, my old school uh, put the, the, there was an incident on the outside of the gates and they just at the moment until they know when the police can let them out that's when they'll do it but it's just seen the uh, the dramatic storyline from the kids in the school just from my sister um yeah. I, I can imagine what it would have been like when I was in school um something yeah. quite exciting we once had a, a an air ambulance come into the field because a, a boy has is a collarbone broken Oh. And I just remember us all running to the, the window and the teacher was like, isn't it like you've never seen a helicopter before? And yeah. I was like, it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> like, this doesn't happen every day. No. Um, no. So yeah, hopefully it gets sorted soon. But oh. I'm more than happy to leave her there overnight. <laughs> it's worrying now. I mean, you yeah. don't want anything like that happening. Yeah, but I feel like at the moment, that's all I seem to hear is, someone's been stabbed or someone's been it, it, something going on there's still uh, a lot in well, i suppose you know cardiff being i worry about mari she's moved back into cardiff mm. you know and um i don't know i mean she used to live on the outskirts of Craiger, and uh i thought oh god you know it was it was much better there because she could go for walks and things on her own. Yeah, you know? it's, it's I'd not safe at the moment. Walks, you know, I'd be worried about her going uh, like yeah. walking the bay from where she is and things like that. So I don't know if she gets out as much, you know. Yeah, no, uh, that, the, even though the shop is two seconds away from me, um, it is a bit worrying in the dark, but I always think that if someone jumps out at me, go on, because I've got my umbrella and I'll, I'll give you a good <laughs> whack with it. it I mean, she, she's not nervous. I mean, she, you know. I'm I'm more of a fiery sort of person. I think, go on, try yeah. and cross past me and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, oh no, I, I <laughs> oh no, I, I, I just, I think I was a bit like, uh, oh, I just ignore everybody you know like yeah I go out and I just ignore everybody and and you know that'll keep me safe sort of thing that was mainly what I, I used yeah. to do yeah so I was I think to... with things that are coming to light now um especially with the Sarah Everard thing um more people because that Sarah Everard done all the right things she had the yeah. she had she had the trainers she had the the, the colorful clothes and she yeah, was on the phone to her boyfriend and it was a police yeah. officer, and I think it just brought up the question, yeah. really, of because yeah. someone was saying that argument of not all men, and we're not saying that. But if you had, if I gave you a bag of uh, Smarties and I said, "Oh, one of them's got cyanide in it," you're going to be weary of all of them. Yeah. You, you don't know. Yeah. Um, so that, no, that's what I was just trying to say to my mate because you know I know my stepdad's nice. But if if I was a girl that didn't know him in the dark, I I would understand them feeling a little bit weary because. It's yeah. the world we live in today. Yeah. I, I, I've had a lot of discussions about that, especially when it comes to my little sisters. It just, mm-hmm. I, 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 it's that thing where I just want it to be a nice world and it's obviously not. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. I, I would feel the same if I had a sister. I mean, I had two brothers and they used to get into enough trouble, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like my, my older brother, I used to, they used to wait for him because he went to uh, Newport High School and we lived in quite a like poor, like, state you know councillors mm. and they used to come home off the bus and they'd be waiting for him you know to punch him up yeah he went to a different school you know 
my my yeah. mum said there was a lot of things because they had um two schools or basically the only thing that separated them was a lane and my mum said there would always be murder after oh, school boy. because they'd be fighting yeah. <coughs> and that school's since gone and they've merged it mm-hmm. together now so uh yeah. but it, it's my school that it's out of the way really we didn't really interact with many other no. kids no we yeah. were the same and um, you know my brother my other brother my younger brother he he never got into any trouble like like that you know mm. but then he was six foot so he was six foot to 12 years old yeah, you wouldn't so. want a mess no <laughs> You know, I, I was always a very quiet one. I think as I've got older now, I've become a little bit more outspoken. If it's, something's annoyed me, I, I'll let it know and I'll leave, yeah. leave it be. But uh, I do yeah. think some people, that they, they just cause fights and troubles. Um, I'm not sure yeah. where Pat is. Um, I don't but... know. Pat, where are you? Pat. Um... Oh. I mean, I don't know if she's got... Um... Well, I hope she didn't think it was like time to go home. No, because she, she normally time. logs out, don't she? Yeah. Um, she's probably just taken a little bit longer. Yeah. I'm not sure if there's um Well uh, if not, I'll I'll share the screen anyway to show you um what I was trying to make because I I know you like a little bit of art, etc. And so you might be uh, interested in this. It was just yeah. what I was arguing really was um this is a second century Roman depiction of the crucifix, uh, the crucifixion. Yeah. And I don't know if you can notice that, that Christ is um, higher. He seems to be very muscular, um, very strong. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's ooh, if my screen wants to work. And then you've got the Anglo-Saxon. Christ is a little bit weaker here. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. His, his arms are a little bit more drooped. His head's a little bit more bowed, um, but still not extreme. Um, and then you get to the later medieval bits where they're showing the angels collecting the blood from yeah. um, the, the, the sides where and Mary, et cetera, at the bottom sort of praying. And then you get to the later medieval oh, yeah. um, and it's even more gory. Um, he's yeah. very weak. Um, it, and I was just sort of showing how religion is developed over time. I feel like yeah. this is just proof that people have sat there, they've meditated because they did try and put themselves into that position of Christ yeah. didn't they so I think this I, I, I think you're right because um I'm thinking of uh naive painting you know like mm. almost the the early Christian painting was almost like naive painting because it yeah. was just sort of very simple and like you know you know a sturdy man sort of thing a man was a man you know and, yeah um yeah so so uh and if you look at like the uh, the Egyptian, you know, like mm. uh, was it ectopic? Not ectopic. Um, you know, the Egyptian desert fathers. Their yeah. their their um, painting is very sort of you know pr- like primitive, you know, yeah. and, and na- naive, you know, and uh, like very decorative. Bit um, folk, folksy as well yeah very folksy yeah yeah I, I like that yeah so yeah, my mum likes a folksy the mentality art. of it is going from you know very simple you know to like you say very um, detailed and well yeah. thought about I think another thing I that, that's why I was trying to relate it to these earlier buildings is because I think they're not going to be the same as um but post-Norman um it's still early st- the, the early beginning so I think Christianity was there but I think we, we've over exaggerated how extreme it was I think it gets extreme as it went on the, these photos to me show how extreme it went because you've got Christ there like that and then mm-hmm. um it's these extreme painful signs of death the discoloration um they've really thought about it. I just, that was what I was just coming to really was that um I think pre-Norman Christianity is going to be much different and a lot more simple um yeah yeah, and I think it's still gonna have some ties with uh the the Romano-British sort of way of because we're still going to be having British sort of culture and beliefs put brought into it um and that's what I was trying to say with the communion as well with the fact that the Lamb of God has been sacrificed for us for our sins yeah, and and um, you know we, we we were like Iron Age, weren't we? I mean, we talked yeah. about Iron Age when the Romans came, and uh, you know 
Romano British must have been, Sorry. you know, a mixture of both, really. You mm. know, the poorer people were just still in the fields and, you know, yeah. agricultural workers. And uh, the people with landowners, you know, they had, they owned the farms and and, and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, it, it's interesting to get into the mindset of a, of the early uh, yeah Christians and the early uh, British, really. And yeah, that, I just I just think that to say that um you know it was gone. Um, with the Romans, uh, with the Normans, I don't, I don't necessarily agree. I just think it just shows no. that it's developed based on different cultures. Pat, I'm not sure whether you saw any of this, but I was just showing depictions of the crucifixion and just how it's changed um, throughout the medieval period. So here in the second century, with, with the Romans, um, he's very strong. He's above everyone. He's very tall. Um, he's got the strength, and the, you get to uh, Anglo-Saxon. He's a little bit more drooped, but he's not as bad um, and then you're getting on a bit and you start to see the wounds the wounds start to become more important and then the later medieval period you've got signs of death and it, it seems like it's been really fought on and I think that is just based on um, meditation throughout time and um, theological debate and people really trying to put themselves into that so that's what I was trying to say with the churches is that um it is going to be different because of it's the early startings of uh, Christianity. And um, yeah, that, that's why I was just trying to argue. And uh, I thought I'd just add those uh, little photos in. They, they're quite horrible to look at, these ones, because they're very detailed. But I just think it shows how much they've really fought about over time. Um, but we'll start back with uh, the churches now after I've had uh, this little say. Um, so this is Old Kogan, so St. Peter's Church in Panath. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's quite interesting because um, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, this part of the church here um, is a different sort of way of brick. So it's, oh, it's called yeah. a yeah. Um, and it's quite frustrating to actually read about it because it seems like um, legends and what people have said about it is sort of affected the history of it. Um, and it's all to do with that pattern in the wall. So if, if, if I think I've got a closer up picture of it. Um, yeah, so these these are just the two photos I've been looking at. Um, and they're saying that this was um, a church that obviously has been uh, affected by flooding, etc. over time. Um, oh, no, I thought I had another image. Yeah, like um, a very herringbone, isn't it? They yes. Yeah, um, they, they were saying that because of this herringbone sort of way of building in their stonework, this suggested that it was Anglo-Saxon and yeah. they believe that this was um, the earlier part of the church. And I, I do think that this has got evidence that it is, it is the early church because mm. um, they've got evidence of the Romans being there as well when they first brought Christianity to Colgan. Um, and they're saying that the energetic Celtic saints from the 5th to the 6th centuries gave the, um, gave the Christian mission a new lease of life. And what they're saying about this, because they've also mentioned St. Doc Deeds of, of being important in terms of this, um, but they've been discussing this um, just based on the stonework. And um, Carl actually sort of done something that was kind of a blow, especially for the church's website and for everyone that's really discussed them. Yes, there possibly was um, an early medieval church there however this isn't signs of it because it was reconstructed in the Victorian times and yeah. they were just sort of copying um, an older part of the reconstruction so it, it's, it's a shame really because you read up about it and it's the one thing that they focus on and it's, it's not necessarily true I think people are looking at uh, things and saying that if it's a herringbone um, style to the stonework, then it must be Anglo-Saxon. No one really yeah. seems to be looking deeply into it. And I think that's what Carl was trying to say, is that we need to look further and try and see, because the, the, the churches and, and, and in their early stages in the early medieval period, and so it, it just seems like this would be an amazing find if it was early medieval, but it's not, and people have just looked at that and have assumed that it was early medieval. But I think because it was in the early stages, it would have been done more out in the open or on the land with maybe a cross like in St. Doctides, where they, 
you know a signpost for everyone to gather and to tell people where to come um so you know, it, it's quite interesting to look at i was quite ashamed to see that it is changed um really when you look into the actual archaeology but it's still amazing either way um and then we get to um another thing of interest as well um oh, let me see if i find the uh the is, is it that one um no, it's not. Yeah, no, this is um this it is Anne um you any um oh, so this is in. yeah um the Benedictine uh pri priority um priori sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry it's, it's one of those days um but my mum's also sorting out the uh attic today so the landing looks like oh, a nightmare no. yeah <laughs> there's been a broken snow globe as well downstairs so i was stuck up here as well in my break oh, um, yeah, you're moving, aren't you? yeah it, it's a nightmare Anne. it's a nightmare um i've put all my box uh, my books away into boxes and it's i think it's going to take a, quite oh. a few boxes it's the only thing that i'm sort of taking with me really is it's all my books yeah. all my room is full of books um yeah, yeah so this place in uh, Ueni um yeah. and it was a, a, Norm, a Norman church built in the 1120s and the foundation was of uh, from the foundation of William de Lord uh, Lond Lond Londres um the Lord of Ogmore Castle and which his son before 1141 uh, Maurice Lundres um, granted this to a Benedictine Abbey of St Peter and Gloucester. At the time it had um, 12 monks um, and the prior was established in Ueni um, and the settlement of Ueni grew soon after this as well and his population was treated uh, that treated the church as a parish um, only the uh, uh, chancel and the transept uh, was reserved for monks and they built the stone buildings, um, more stone buildings uh, nearby in the 13th century. But it was fortified quite early on in the 12th uh, century and this was in order to protect against Welsh armed attacks and the fortifications were staffed, uh, staffed by permanent garrison and they were just watching over the st two stone gatehouses that are there um, and this is the plan of it as well um, that you can see being left behind um, and what we're trying to argue here is that um, th this was fortified so that the, the grey parts here are all this is uh, the medieval and then the young coloured parts are later um, but what what we were trying to discuss was that clearly this was something that was possibly not completely favoured by the Welsh and so um, in need of protection to in order to bring these uh, new religious orders from the Normans into Wales and um, into Britain as well and um, I think that these Welsh attacks are, are very important to um, the, the, the the Union of uh, Wales Act in uh, the 1530s because in 15 32, for example, back to land Devonry, um, it was uh, Hugh Aparis in 1532, he had a, a rebellion at land Devonry Castle, which was Norman, like I said, and he he burnt this down. Um, and I think it just sort of showed the need of, uh, of having um, a union with Wales in the end, because it seemed like this was just under attack by a lot and I think they needed to sort of control it really but this is important because it's showing how um, the Norman tried to bring their own type of re religious orders here and it was shown two divisions really in Wales you had um, what the Romano-British um, kept going into the early me medieval period and then you have what the Normans had brought and the Normans had them heavily fortified because I personally think it was something that the Welsh people and the people of Britain didn't feel like they related to really and um, because of that it was under attack and they needed to sort of carry on keeping it in good condition and ensure that it wasn't under attack um, and I think that's another reason why St Augustine um, came to uh, Britain 
um, because there was a lot of division and they didn't really want that. Um, Rome didn't really want this division um, with the two different types of religious orders. So I think he came here to sort of try and unify all this. Um, and it, I think this just sort of showed how after the Norman period, it, it, you see more grander, bigger um, buildings, whereas in the early medieval period, we're starting to see them a lot more smaller and simpler. And it seems like they have been demolished in a way. And like the one that we were just looking at um, here at Lindisfarne, um, they've been placed there maybe to remember what once was there. But I, to me, it just shows that it's the development of religion over time that, yes, the early medieval period was religious, but not as religious as we thought it was because it's in the early stages. They're still talking and having theological debate about it. Um, and then we get to um, this interesting church in uh, Bricksworth. Um, it's called oh. All Saints Church. Um, and one thing I thought was quite interesting about this was um, because they're saying this is um, from the Anglo-Saxon period. Now, that, hear me out. I didn't really sort of speak to Carl about this. So this is probably just something that I, I've just sort of sharing with you guys. Um, but remember when we had that letter about the uh, round towers of Ireland? Um, oh. It's almost like they've got this uh, this round tower here, but it's not it's not fully complete. Mm. I was thinking maybe is this something that was taken from Ireland because in the early medieval period we have a lot of writings from Ireland. Mm. It seems like Ireland really holds the Christian religion strongly and helped influence the rest of Britain. And I was thinking maybe this is sort of a, 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 a round tower that has sort of developed further. Um, not too sure, but it would be quite interesting to see if that was somewhere where monks had gone for their own special place, maybe to be uh, writing manuscripts or for reflection or parents, etc. But that's what I thought when I saw this. I just saw round tower. Um, but the stone here is quite interesting and is sort of led to even more of a discussion. So this is thought to... Um, to, to, to be uh, Anglo Saxon. Um, there's a lot of restoration from uh, the Victorian period, but the Peterborough Chronicle had recorded uh, Bricksworth to have a monastery, Bricksworth Abbey, and that was founded by Sethwolf, um, the Bishop of Mercia, um, before the death of the King of uh, Wolfia in 675 AD. And many elements of the original building remain still visible um, along later um, additions from further phases of the building in the 10th, the 14th and the 19th centuries. But the older buildings are typically found uh, uh, typically found in architecture of later periods. Uh, so um, it, it seems to have a lot of mixture. But what they're saying here is about the architecture of it. It seems to be Roman Romanesque is what they said. Mm -hmm. um, the church is in the form of an early Christian basilica with um, piers instead of columns inside. Mm -hmm. And what remains of the original building um, is, a, is just the nave part um, and the north-south arcades, which are blocked and infilled with windows. Um, and another, uh, they've also have a, a, a by the, from the nave there was a great arch as well. Um, but what they're trying to say here is that they seem to think that they, the stonework of some of this was taken from um, Roman buildings as well nearby, maybe a Roman villa. And so yeah. it shows that the early medieval period of making use of the things that the Romans had left behind um, and have made these great structures. But to me, the only thing that just really stuck out was just that that sort of tower on the side because it did it's look like strange. one of the front it's a strange design isn't it yeah it, it's, it's it's very strange it, it is probably the only thing you know that it, it does remind us of Ireland you know um mm -hmm. but uh I and I know that the, the stonework was was from Roman you know originally from Roman uh, buildings and that you know the, yeah. the, the foundations and the early church but yeah I mean it's it's worth carrying it with you that little idea and um, seeing yeah. if you can find a link <laughs> well they, they, they clearly oh hang on sorry I'm sorry my uh, laptop yeah, went all dull so I think he's about to uh, die so I'm quickly plugging it in now oh, um, right. the, testing my patience <laughs> 
yeah no i think uh, it shows how i think the early medieval period is um they do have sort of ties with uh, christianity but i think it's still oh, romanized no, really i think that's saxon. What... i thought that roundedness was very saxon actually <coughs> mm, um, yeah, that's, that's what they're saying they think is anglo-saxon and especially with it being mentioned in the peterborough chronicle oh, right, yeah because um, when, we, when we went to Norfolk, Pat was with us. Yeah. We did see a church there that was, it was very rounded, wasn't it? It had like a, a round sort of tower and, and then a spire. I'll have to yeah. look it up. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that can be your homework, Anne. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, I think it, it's, it's important because it's even uh, mentioned here as well, because this is in Winchester. They're talking about the martyrdom of uh, Lyft. Uh, Lifheath of Canterbury, who was a bishop of Winchester, and this is also in a different chronicles. You've got the Anglo-Saxon chronicles come into play here with this. So it's nice to see that this site has got um, two loads of documentary evidence that backs it up, but um, yeah. it's still question marks of what it would have looked like. Um, mm -hmm. I think obviously there would have been more things added to it, especially in the Victorian period. Um, but it, 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 it just seems very inclusive as well from what it used to be like instead of columns it was just peers and everyone sort of was together in one room worshipping together rather than having sections off as yeah. well and I think that's I think I would say in terms of all this argument is that the Normans possibly would have eradicated some of this Romano-British um, Christianity but I think they also would have helped it develop as well because people wouldn't have forgotten and um, people hold on to it. Look, the Reformation, for example, um, I know it was going back and forth Protestant and Catholic a lot, but people still held on to their um, their faith no matter what. And they probably would have done it privately I, I, and something that people would yeah, have held close to them. It's people's identity, isn't it? You yeah. Know? And, and um, they would fight for it. Um, but a lot of it is... Uh, land as well, land yeah. and power. You know, yeah, because I, I, I remember um, when I was in primary, we had um, one of my friends, he was Portuguese, and his uh, nan always used to come to our little services every week. And she would straight up not have communion if she couldn't have a confession beforehand, which it, it was something crazy for us because yeah. we were we just went for yeah. a communion, but it showed that she was a, an older generation yeah. of catholicism and it just shows how uh, i think it, you know yeah. the, that it would be that situation in the yeah. the norman times of or um you know my nan practices this in a little different way um but it's still similar um so i think that you know yeah. they would have developed it further i think that's what would have happened really yeah. um this one's quite an interesting one as well um this is um oh let me see if i can find my notes um, this is uh, by Win Winchester Cathedral oh. and this is um, something that's of interest because they seem to think that this is showing evidence of um, next to this grand cathedral is a, a smaller more open space sort of structure that they had found through um, their archaeological um, investigations if you want to put it that way <laughs> um, and this this is interesting because um, they, they they've obviously put the, the the earthworks in themselves, but it would have been all like this. And what they're saying is is that this part that I've just outlined, maybe that's where everyone came to worship, all here, mm -hmm. and possibly this is where the altar would have been, um, and maybe someone would have spoke from here. Um, and they're just showing how again, it's right, it's overlapping a little bit. This great big um cathedral here um but what i was sort of thinking of with this was that maybe it's just signs of where the normans possibly would have sort of tried to turn um earlier medieval sort of cathedrals and places of worship into a different way by having their own cathedral plonked on top of it um and all we have now is the earthwork left behind and they've also marked it out which is quite nice to see that they've marked it out um mm. And it, it, it's, it's almost similar that this, that, you know, to to uh, to Bricksworth, how they've built on top of or on the grounds of an early medieval um, church or somewhere to uh, study. Um, one thing also that they mentioned for Bricksworth, sorry to go back, if my mouse wants to work, 
um, here is that they're saying that it's also got um, it, it looks a little bit like he was from the Byzantine pre-Norman sort of thing oh. as well so that, that you've got that connection with it I think we need to sort of get into grips of the Byzantine world as well and his effect on that as well yeah. but what they're saying here with this is that is it, this is sort of this is Anglo-Saxon um, and this was when the England's pagan monarchy was becoming Christians and they're saying that is uh, they built this little um, sort of cross-shaped church almost um, as and they've known called this the Old Minster and you can see where it stood is outlined here and um, it became a cathedral and it was um, housing the throne of a bishop who held a sway over a huge diocese that stretched um, all around and it's important, I think, to, it, it was important in the Anglo-Saxon period, and it was the burial place of some of the earliest uh, kings of Wessex as well, so King Alfred the Great. Um, and you see a lot of people having a lot of ties to this, is even said to be a place of pilgrimage, this place as well. Um, and it was a community for monks living a simple life. Um, of prayer and um, it shows them that, that this monastery then this later monastery came when the Normans arrived um, they brought a lot of changes and um, they they toppled over great military power and sort of forced their own religious orders on onto this space erasing what they thought was early medieval period but it's not erased for archaeologists we can still see it and we've laid it out today but I think it, it's a very interesting structure and the way that it's just sort of been plonked uh, this big great cathedral has been plonked on top of it as well and this um this is also another site I, I just wanted to sort of bring to um when anyone who sort of knows the, my love fan Christ knows that I talk about St Bridget a lot and um, they said that St Bridget was the first anchorite um, and there's a lot of illuminated manuscripts showing um, St Bridget um, with a crown on her head because um, anchorites would have been given a ring or a crown when they uh, they go for like a wedding ceremony like brides to be married with God and these either have a ring, ring or a crown and there's, there's a lovely little uh, illuminated uh, manuscript image that shows um, uh, St Bridget sort of writing in a little anchorite cell. This is meant to be the church that she's uh, said to come from here and it, it, it's very interesting because it shows that these churches are being tied with saints etc so I think the fact that churches like this stayed up it showed that they would have had um, some importance and you definitely see how Anchorite and that sort of way of living with Ankara, Wissa, um, who uh, the work on how to be an Anchorite from the early medieval period, um, it, it shows that the religion's changing and I don't think the Normans successfully got rid of everything like that because it still stays firmly in our minds especially when we can put places to saints um, with Linda's farm with St Aidan and this was St Bridget. Um, um, this is at St Bridget's Church. Um, I've, forgot, I've forgotten where I'm looking for my notes as I'm speaking to you, Anne. So hang on, I'll type. This is in Britain or Ireland? I know we got um, lots from where. This is in Britain. Um, is say is, is uh, um, it's, it's Saint oh, Saint Brig. I'll, I'll find it now Ooh, and I can't seem to I find it for no I don't know where, where it's gone I've I had it on my google docs and I cannot for the love of me hang on I'll find it now I think I've got it in my written notes um St Brigitte that's what the church is known as St Brigitte um in England I believe so St Brigitte's church oh, right. St Brigitte um, well, they all claimed it, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, and I, I, this, that, see, this is what confused me because um, I, I, I love St. Bridget. That, um, I thought she was what, Irish. Yeah, but... no, I've, I've seen lots of evidence of different churches claiming that yeah. she was there, for example. So um, it'd be quite interesting to, to try and find the parish of, uh, parish of St. Bridget. Um, St. Brig, is it Bridget? St. Bridget, St. Bride's. Um, no, there's, there's one in Wales, obviously, but um, 
the, the, yeah, the, the, this is uh, the, this one in uh, Wales. I'll find out on my research where I found this from um, because it's driving me up the absolute wall now. Um, <laughs> and I thought I yeah. had it written down. Um, but one thing that I want to sort of end with with this as well, because um, it's it, while we discuss, I'll quickly look through my notes. Um, but this here um, is... Um, a yew tree and they found a lot of these old yew trees on the sites of churches especially early medieval churches yeah. and um they believe uh, that this okay. could possibly have a, a significance to the early christianity of uh britain as well so um what they are uh, and i found out with our churches i've just looked at it here oh. cumbria st brigham church oh. Oh. um so that, that apparently st bridget was there it was of norman build um and it's got something oh, in common with you any there's a st bridget of ireland and there's a st bridget of sweden that's yeah interesting oh, yeah wow. that, that, that's saying that's very interesting it, yeah. it's, said, it's said that this is meant to be a church so whether okay. she came from ireland and had an influence on britain she's that way there. she's from county kildare <laughs> yeah yeah so it, it, it I think it, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to see if she has an influence. Really, it seems to be a, a lot of saints for the saints, si si similar names as well. And so, yeah. um, but th this is also said to be similar to Yuani as well because um, some stones that they found in Yuani, um, mm. they believe had some Roman um, carved stones used as well. So it's the same with uh, Saint Doctis, and they're using it with the cross. There also is the same with um, Brixworth as well, this use of uh, Roman stone around them. Um, but this is from the Norman period as well. And yeah. there's something, I think there's something going on with all this, I think we can gather that's not really being discussed. But we get to Lang uh, Ger Gernu, um, and in this church is an old yew tree. Um, mm. And there's a lot of yew trees put into churches, very old ones, and they think this one is uh, dated for, uh, to be 2,000, 4,000 years old um, between that period. So it's, it's a big jump of 2,000 years that yeah. you'd have to know. But what they're saying is, is that this church was placed at the site of this tree. And so they were saying that possibly in the early medieval period, were they using yew trees as an importance to them in terms of like St. Doctor's Cross, having everyone stand near that, maybe this yew tree was a, a significance of getting everyone to gather. One thing I thought was quite interesting in terms of the importance of the yew tree as well is that they said that um, some Catholics have believed that, um, or, or Christians have believed that yew trees were used for Jesus' cross and so that holds another significance in terms of Christianity as well um, and it, it seems that these yew trees um, are on consecrated ground and it has, um, it has a lot of importance in terms of uh, early medieval religion but as we get to present day it's been surrounded by a lot of superstition especially this yew tree here they say that um, it will bleed red um, on certain nights if uh, if Wales is 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 going through trouble. Um, if something happens, if there's going to be um, bishops or priests um, dying nearby in, from the church, then it'll it'll bleed red. Um, a lot of superstition with it. But I think the older you go with some things like this, there's a lot of superstition. You see it with Tinkins Wood, um, etc. If you go there on Halloween. Um, you'll have a, a wish granted to you. Um, so, yeah, I think things like this are, you know, they're surrounded by superstition. And I think we need to look further because there's yeah, something that's not I, being discussed here. I don't know if Pat remembers, but I think yew trees were always on pagan sites as well, often on pagan sites. Yeah. So, um, so the like the yew tree came first, and then yeah. The church afterwards but yeah and i think that I, the, what, what i was trying to get is that maybe they possibly put the church there yeah because of the importance of the yew tree yeah um, i don't think they disrespected it i think they respected it you know because they would have had the old mm. old ways you know merged yeah. with the new sort of thing yeah no, the, the, maybe the, that's a symbol yeah there have been, um, I have read as well, how some churches have planted some of these trees into their, um, in their 
y- okay. the yeah. yard as well. Yeah. So um, that seems quite yeah. interesting. Um, so I, I do think that if the yew tree's got significance, and I think it changed in significance to the later medieval period with it being the woods that was used for Jesus' cross. Um, and I think as time has gone on, it's, it's been surrounded by a lot of... Um, the, the, so oral history can sometimes be a bit like Chinese whispers. It can sort of change over yeah. time with whatever people remember. So um, I think that's what has been a, a victim of, really, is sort of people haven't written down what the importance was of these at the time and it's been left to people sort of theorizing and when people don't really know the answer to it they come across with uh, these superstitious supernatural theories as well Um, but I I generally think that yew trees were there as part of uh, in connection with um, early medieval Christianity because it, it was it was important to them with their but before Christianity and they brought it with them through Christianity and it's something that they felt like was needed in their churchyards and yeah. to be kept safe. Yeah. So that's the uh, end of that. So I'll ask Ooh. questions. And is there anything that you'd like to that, ask? That was, that was perfect timing, Jess. I don't know how. Oh, well, I didn't realise the time. Oh, thank you. Sometimes I can yeah. go over. I find lessons like this much more easier. Yeah, Whereas that. in uni, when they tell me that I've got four minutes to present something, I feel like I've become a rapper overnight because I'm <laughs> trying to get everything out really fast. Oh, no, it was it was interesting. And, and you know, we're the food for um, putting more weight to our history, really, mm. you know, and, and um, making it more important, you know, yeah. to, to sort of uh, understand our sites. You know, because uh, I mean, we go to see like um, Bronze Age and Neolithic mm-hmm. and things, you know, and then there's that bit in between, you know, the and and the, and you know, you the Iron Age, and it's 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 hard. I like to try and put myself there, you know, in that place, and yeah, and that's what I'm trying to. That's what the early medieval is yeah I I think one thing that's important to consider as well is that the Romans I know there would have been the odd sieges up in Scotland that we've got evidence of there is no evidence of Roman sieges on on native land really and I do think in terms of um, the Romans and the Vikings everything before Norman although they get painted very violently they allowed that early medieval religion to still keep going on and it was only until the Normans where they tried putting their own cathedrals and abbeys you Mm -hmm. see it sort of changing um I think ultimately they I believe that it wasn't completely erased I think maybe it was just part of a development and the Normans sort of erased part of the earlier developments and it's something that's just left as a question mark and archaeologists to try and find out now yeah yeah. yeah so thank you Anne okay, um Pat thank anything you. that you'd like to say just say sorry my grandson who's a year old is downstairs oh. and to help my husband so um, oh bless they, I, I can imagine your hands being quite full chair and they've gone out in the wind so oh, oh gosh <laughs> hopefully they're all tired he's, he's, he's gone out in the wind well yeah the wind, he go out out in the wind? with the dogs as well oh. so Oh, fingers, they both come back safe and sound. <laughs> oh. Yeah, they don't get blown <laughs> off into the wind. <laughs> no, yeah, but thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it was take care. I'll see you next week. Okay, yeah, he's not coming back, is he? No, um, I don't think so. Um, so yeah, I'll okay. speak to you next week. See you next okay. week, then. Yeah, take okay, care, guys, bye. and good luck with the little bye. one, Pat. Okay, bye. yes, I'll do my best. <laughs> Oh.